Okay, so I'm going to pull some of these slides from the PowerPoint pack that's up in um, Canvas and just highlight a few of them and talk about this chapter. This chapter is pulling in the financial statements and how to assemble them, plus the year-end accounting needed for merchandising. We've already done year-end accounting, uh, closing and adjusting, but these are just specific to the merchandising business that we added here near the end of the class. So we're just going to give this a shot and uh, work through some of these just so you can get a feel for what's different here. We already kind of know about financial statements also, but this one allows us to see a little more detail about what happens when you do more specific financial statements. I'm going to go ahead and get this thing to be nice to me. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so the first thing is the single step um, income statement, which is just listing all the revenue and then listing all the expenses to come down to net income. Now, that's what we traditionally think of as an income statement. But for financial statement purposes, when you do um, an income statement in accordance with GAAP, it has to be instead classified in a different way. And the same thing with the balance sheet, they have to be classified so that um, a classified balance sheet that shows you current and non-current of the asset section and the liability section. And then for the income statement, it shows a multi-step income statement that helps us to see what the costs are. Because you see on this single, uh, just this single step income statement would work just fine for a company that doesn't have merchandise. I mean, mostly there's not a lot of differentiation needed, but for a company that has merchandise, they have this huge, I'm sorry, think about it. They have this huge number here for cost of goods sold. You see that? And it's not clear what is involved in coming to that number. And as you know, from what we've learned that cost of goods sold is a complex calculation. And so um, we have learned how to master it, but it's not just obvious what's involved whenever you see the number cost of goods sold. So that's why the multi-step is much more effective for companies that have merchandise. So let's look at it. This is a multi-step um, income statement using build, built from the end of period worksheet. And so you remember on the end of period worksheet, uh, everything's listed there. And we sometimes will make a schedule that's wide enough where we can just have income statement only in some of the final columns and balance sheet only in some of them. But sometimes it just says the adjusted trial balance. And if so, for an income statement, we know we just start picking up the accounts at the revenue accounts. And so we would show all revenue. Then we would show um, all expenses in a single step. But in this case, for a uh, multi-step income statement, instead we would show the income related to the product. Um, and then we would show the cost of goods sold to bring us to a gross profit, a net number <clears throat> that's sales minus cost of goods sold that brings us to how much net did we make from our product. And then we would show all the other expenses under the operating expense. Okay, so that's what this is doing. And so you see they pulled uh, sales minus sales returns and allowances. That's how they came up with their um, net sales number. And then that was this yellow piece right here. And then um, they, on a multi-step, the other income that's not related to the product would be listed under other income down here at the bottom. See this yellow down here? That's coming from the same section of revenues. But if it doesn't relate to the product, then it's not going to be up here in this top section using a multi-step income statement. Instead, it would be under unrelated income, sort of, so to speak, which they call other revenue. Okay, so all these revenues have to go somewhere and the contra revenue, sales returns and allowance. So the first two sales and sales returns and allowance are the ones that we took over here to the revenue section and they helped us to come up with this net sales number in our multi-step income statement. And then we pulled what we needed to do the cost of goods sold section. So as you know, cost of goods sold is a combination of it starts out the beginning inventory plus whatever purchases we made, but knowing that those purchases might have some contra purchases accounts related to them, which they did. And so what they did to come up with this is we start out, we're coming to this goods available number, and then we're going to get our goods, goods uh, cost of goods sold number. So first we have to see what the cost of goods available is. And so that is the combo of the beginning inventory and the purchases after all the netting for the returns and discounts. So we start with this beginning inventory and they have, um, we pull, we have to pull that from the balance sheet. It's not good, or from the end of period worksheet, more likely that um, the section about the assets. 
So that's where this is coming from, this uh, inventory number here uh, and the estimated returns inventory, those two together make up the inventory number because really they're not, they don't have to be segregated. They could be left together as um, just inventory, which it, most businesses actually have them together instead of two separate lines. Um, and so that number, this inventory number is our beginning inventory, the combo of these two. And then um, the, we add to that the purchases. We pull that from the income statement columns of the independent statement. And that would be purchases minus the returns and allowances and minus the discounts to bring us to a net purchases number. So once you know what your net purchases number is, you add that to your beginning inventory and that tells you how much inventory is, um, is available to sell. And so, you know, we talked about this before in the course is the beginning plus the purchases, net purchases, brings you to goods available. And that's all the goods you have that you can sell. You either did sell them, so they're cost of goods sold, or else they are still sitting there in your inventory, so they're in your ending inventory. So once we know what goods available is, we subtract from that our ending inventory to leave us with the number that should be used for cost of goods sold. So ending inventory, again, is on the worksheet as the in the ending columns after adjustment. Um, and that's the big ending balances that you would use for both the inventory itself and the estimated returns number. And so you see this column here, this has no highlighting. It shows the, the uh, beginning inventory total plus the purchases after all is said and done to bring two goods available minus the ending inventory com combination to bring you to cost of goods sold. So nothing has changed. That is exactly like we learned it. So when you take the net sales, again, no highlights, these numbers after we've netted everything out, net sales minus this cost of goods sold number, that brings you to the, the term gross profit. And so that is the amount we made on just the product sales. After we paid for the product, this is how much profit we made just on the goods that we were selling, reselling or producing and selling, either one. And so there's our total of gross profit. From that, we reduce for the other operating expenses, which is just all these expenses. They're pulled from the worksheet over to our income statement, but we still are gonna have the same expenses for, simple, for the single step or for the multi-step, we're still gonna have exactly the same net income. And the total revenue is gonna be the same, the total expense is gonna be the same, but it's just how it's presented in the form that's different. And so all the expenses that we haven't picked up yet, um, are all transferred over here as operating expenses to get a total operating expenses that we can use to reduce our gross profit down to income from operations. So this is talking about how much did we make on the operations, not counting other kind of unrelated revenue and unrelated expense. And so one expense that shows up in unrelated expense every time is interest expense. In, in actuality, companies can't really operate very efficiently without borrowing money and using the interest to help them operate. But nonetheless, it's not considered to be a normal operating expense. It's an, it's an other expense item. And so we have to pull it down here with our other revenues like interest revenue and grant and uh, anything that's not related to the product or service we provide. So when we get through with all this tallying, we wind up with a net income figure that again, totally matches the one we would have done before we made a multi-step income statement. But this way, when you look at it, you get a better feel for where is our net revenue coming from? Oh, I see, it's mostly from the goods that we sold. And so that helps you to get a perspective on how everything works. Okay, so now the statement of owner's equity. We've already talked about this some. Um, this statement is very crucial to understanding what happened in the company. You start with your beginning equity, which is this 4072, the capital account, and it ends up with the ending equity, your capital account 5136. So you start with, okay, at this beginning of this period, we had 4072 of, of a capital. That's how much the, the owner's part or share of the company is. Then if they added some more investments, we would put that in there. And if, if they did, that, then we would subtotal for, okay, now here's the total equity that was in the business that we had something to play with. And then we have to add to that the net income from this period from the um, income statement that we prepare and subtract 
any withdrawals that were paid to the owners. And so when we take 472 and subtract these um, and add the income and subtract the withdrawals, we wind up with the ending capital account. And that is, this is good because this helps us to see where, how much equity that owner has, or it could be multiple owners, of course. If it were a sole proprietor, it would be just one person, but if it's a partnership, it would be more. Um, and then when you get into working with corporations later, we'll be talking about a large group of people that are the owners. But in any case, then the next thing that we would do is we would build a balance sheet from still the ending uh, end of period worksheet. And we would take all these assets that are listed at the beginning of the worksheet. The assets are always first, and they're usually listed in the order of liquidity, which makes them just right, the right order to be put on the balance sheet. Now, this is what you call a classified balance sheet because it is classified by current and non-current. And so we have all the assets that are going to turn into cash or would, would produce cash to, within one year period. Those are considered current. And so that would start out being the cash account, of course, because it's already cash. And then accounts receivable generally has a short turnaround. So it would be in the um, also in the current assets. Merchandise inventory and the estimate return inventory would also be in the current period. They would turn around in the current period. And the supplies account likewise would be used in the current period. The prepaid insurance would normally be used up in the current period, meaning the year that's coming forward. So within one year, if we're expecting that to turn into a, it to be used in the business, either turn into cash or be used up if it's an asset that's prepaid, like supplies or prepaid insurance, then those would be how we would, that's how we decide it, whether it's current or non-current. So generally these, these names are always current. So if you have one of those, assume it's current. Uh, and so we have the current assets because we told, pulled all those in that section. And then we put the next section in for property, plant, and equipment. We pull land and buildings, equipment, all these things into property, plant, and equipment. And then if we had some other assets, which this one doesn't, that did not relate to, that were not short term. So they weren't, they weren't to go in the current section, but they weren't property, plant, and equipment, like investment in other companies or investment in stocks and bonds. Those could go um, in, under a, a topic called investments or other other assets. And so there's other kinds of assets that could show up on a balance sheet as well too. But these are just the most, most prevalent, especially in these examples that they'll be showing in the textbook. So we put our plant, property plant and equipment there under the assets, then with the accumulated depreciation related to it, if there is some right under it. So we could have a net value, also called a net book value, NBV of each of these different assets. So these numbers over here to the right, um, for building and equipment, that is a net book value because that's the amount of the cost of the asset minus the depreciation related to it. So when you tally up all this, these together that are under property and equipment and then just put a total over here, then you can say, here's the total for current assets. Here's the total for property and equipment. So here's my total assets. And you might have more than just these two categories. Like I said, there might be other assets that are listed. Um, but this is our total assets. Okay, then we would go to liabilities. We would pull the current ones first, which are the ones that are going to come due within 12 months. So whatever's going to be payable soon within the 12 month period needs to show up in this current liability section. So that means if you have a note payable, probably you have to pay payments during this current 12 month, upcoming 12 month period. That would be the current portion of a long-term debt. And so it needs to be in the current section. And then the rest of the note that's going to be due in future years would show up as a long-term asset. So that's why you see uh, this is a short-term note payable they have listed here. And then accounts fail. They put them also in order of liquidity, meaning how soon will they have to be paid? And so they, they put this note payable very soon. So obviously it was due within days of the end of the period. And so accounts payable is normally the first one because it's usually the most urgent need to be paid. And then the, um, these different, the customer refunds payable would go here, wages payable, all these short-term payables would come right in the section. And then here, the, the mortgage payable, 
That is just the current portion of the long-term debt. And then down here under long-term loan, you have the rest of the mortgage payable, which is just when you borrow money on your building and they take a mortgage and it's over a long period of time. Just the one that's going to be due within the year shows up as the current portion in the current asset, I mean, the current liability section. And so then any other long-term liabilities you had would go down here. Uh, and that what they did is netted it out. You wouldn't have to do this. You could just put the long-term portion down here under long-term liabilities. But in any case, you wind up with the total of the liabilities that would be um, entered here. Then the total equity, which in this case is just their capital, the owner's capital. And then add the liabilities plus the equity, and you would come to the same number if, of the assets, assuming you did it correctly, right? So basically, this is what classified means. It's simply pulling out the current portion so you can get a better idea and so you can do a ratio analysis to see how you're doing. Do you have enough current assets to cover your current liabilities and that kind of thing? And so we're going to do some of this analysis but this is gonna be a big tool that'll help us because it's already segregated by current and long-term, okay? Now, financial statement analysis, which is what I was talking about, is how we evaluate how strong we are financially and how profitable the business is looking. So it's not just internal users that would use these. A lot of people that are considering buying stock or even considering going to work for a certain company would look at these analysis tools to see how strong a company is, to see if it would be a good idea to associate with them. And so um, managers inside use it, but so do creditors and so do potential uh, employees or those who would maybe suppliers and vendors before they make a relationship with you of any kind, they, your company, they might wanna see your financial condition in the form of this financial analysis. And so there's balance sheet analysis and there's um, inter, um, income statement analysis or sometimes known as interstatement analysis, which uses some of the balance sheet and some of the income statement to do the, the calculations. We'll do some of both. Um, and then, so the balance sheet analysis basically is uses the current assets and liabilities to do calculations for working capital, current ratio, and quick ratio. Well, let's see what we got involved in those. The working capital one is the first one we'll talk about. And basically they just use the balance sheet numbers for current assets and current liabilities. And just take the current assets minus the current liabilities to see how much extra assets do I have that are turning into cash than the expectation of what I'm gonna to have to pay, which is the current liabilities. So if I know I have 127,900 coming in because my current assets are that amount, and I know I have outgo uh, that's going to go out in this period of 34.8 because that's what my current liability says, then I know I'm fine. I have plenty of working capital, $93,100 to spare for working capital that I can use to run the business. Okay, that's working capital. Then the current ratio uses these same exact things, the current asset, the current liabilities, but it uses them in a different way to see what is the ratio of my current assets to my current liabilities, meaning how do I have at least as much, which would be a 1.0 or a one-to-one -one ratio, which is obviously you need at least that much, but the target would be 1.5 or higher. But, um, and some people say two to one. So in other words, to make sure you're not gonna run into cash flow problems, you really need to have a good strong ratio of your current assets to your current liabilities. So all you do is take current assets divided by current liabilities. So in this case, this current asset from the sunflower that they were using in their example in the book is 87.9 divided by the current liabilities of 34.8 brought us to 2.5 as our current ratio. And so that really is indicating that you have 2.5 times as much assets available during the next period as the liabilities that are going to come due. So it looks great. Quick assets is another one some people do. Basically, it does the current ratio over um, with just using the current, the most current of the assets. And so usually that's assets that you could turn to cash very quickly within just a couple of months or less. So that would include cash, accounts receivable and temporary investments, which would be just like um, a, a short-term CD or something like that or a money market account. Um, but short-term investments, meaning something very liquid that you could turn into cash if you needed it. And so to do a quick ratio um, calc, you just do, take those quick assets that we just mentioned, 
and divide it by current liabilities to see what was the ratio of the most liquid of your current assets, which is called the, current, the quick assets. And so in this case, we took the 39,000, which included uh, cash accounts receivable, and then we divided that by current liabilities to get us to 1.1 is the ratio. We needed it to be at least one, and some people do less because this is the most liquid of assets, but, but uh, it's, it's more comfortable if it's one to one, of course. All right, now this, the return on owner's equity, we're gonna use the balance sheet for this one. Um, I'm sorry, uh, we're gonna use the, no, we're not gonna use the balance sheet. We're gonna use the um, statement of owner's equity for this one, because we need net income and we need average owner's equity. So for that purpose, we would need to know what is the net income, and we could get that from the income statement. But if you remember, we just looked at the owner's equity statement, and it included the net income on it. So if we need two things in order to calculate the return on owner's equity, we need net income. Well, here it is right here on our owner's equity statement. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back. 100400 and then we need the average capital account or the average equity. And so we, there's our beginning equity or capital, 4072. Here's our ending, 5136. So to get the average of two numbers, obviously it's nothing complicated. It's not tricky. It's just still the average is just like it was in grade school where you take two numbers and divide it by two. So the average is 4072 plus 5136 and then divided by two. So that's going to give us an average that we can use for our denominator. So we're using 100,400 for the numerator, and then this average of 4072 and 5136 for the denominator. So that's where we, uh, this one is, let's see. So that's what they have done right here. So they, the numerator is the net income, 100,400. The denominator is the combination of the beginning and the ending divided by two, the average of owner's equity. So that's where this 406, 460, 400 is coming from. And so when you take 100,400 divided by 46400, your return on equity is 21.8%. Now, then we have accounts receivable turnover. On this one, we're using a beginning and ending balance and divided by two again, an average for accounts receivable. And that's gonna be our, um, our um, average accounts receivable. We're going to use the net credit sales for the numerator and the average accounts receivable for the debt denominator. So this is one of those interstatement calculations of financial analysis. And so we'll use, we need the income statement and we need the balance sheet. Now in the problem, it'll have to tell you, your balance sheet only shows the end of the period accounts receivable. So they'll usually just say it in their problem statement that this is what the beginning of accounts receivable was. So in this case, Beginning accounts receivable um, plus ending accounts receivable, 10,000 plus 13. So divided by two gives you the average of 11.5. We're going to use that in our accounts receivable turnover. Net credit sales. Now, and when you do a, 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 a multi step income statement, it brings you to net credit sales. You remember that. It brings you to net sales. And the problem will tell you if, it's, if, it, if some percentage of it was cash or if all of it was credit. If it doesn't say otherwise and they have accounts receivable, you assume it is credit sales. But sometimes they'll say, there's this much of the sales that were cash. In that case, you would have to pull the cash part out. All right, so the net credit sales were 110,000 divided by the average accounts receivable, bringing you to a accounts receivable turnover or 9.6. Now, once you have a 9.6, that's telling you how many, how much, how many times did you sell enough to cover all of the accounts receivable? Um, that's how many times your accounts receivable turned over. And so then you can take that number and use it to calculate the number of days uh, sales that are in the um, accounts receivable. So the, the collection period, how, how many days, I'm sorry, how many, not the number of days sales, how many days does it take to collect the accounts receivable? And so if you take 365 days and you divide that by 9.6, which was the accounts receivable turnover number, um, then that will bring you to the fact that it, if it's going to turn over 9.6 times in the year, that means 38 days are in each turnover cycle. 
In other words, every 38.2 days, the whole accounts receivable could be collected. So that's what that's talking about. Okay, and then the inventory works similarly because we're gonna calculate an inventory turnover and then we're gonna see how many days does it take the inventory to totally turn over. And say um, this one, we're going, you can compare, they mentioned that you can compare it to prior years, other companies or an industry average. And that's the same thing with accounts receivable turnover. You could also do that, compare it. A lot of these ratios can be used to compare two different companies to see which one you want to invest in or which one you would like to work for. And so this is really important to know how to use these formulas. Turnover, it's like this. It's still the same thing as our other turnover calc for, for um, accounts receivable, but this one's just using the inventory. So we're going to calculate an average inventory based on here's the beginning inventory, here's the ending inventory. And then we're going to use that average inventory as our denominator and our numerator is going to be cost of goods sold. So we're going to use the, the uh, classified, in, I mean, the uh, multi-step income statement to come up with the cost of goods sold number because it's already there. It's going to say cost of goods sold, 244.4 in this case. And then we're going to divide that by our average inventory that we got from the balance sheet. And again, they would have to tell us what the beginning was. If, if we didn't have two years worth of balance sheets, they would have to tell us what the beginning one was. But if they have both years available, we could just look at the ending inventory for one year and that's the beginning inventory for the next, right? Or we could look, we could pull this entire thing rather than using it as an interstatement calc. We could look only at the um, multi-step income statement. And it, as you know, has a cost of goods sold section that shows beginning inventory and ending inventory. So we could pull our inventory calc from it. And so let's go back and look at that income statement, see if we can find the three numbers we need. This is the income statement. We need three numbers from it. We need cost of goods sold. Okay, great. There it is right there. See that? Right on this line right before gross profit. And we need the average inventory number. So they gave us in the section for cost of goods sold, they gave us beginning inventory. And we're gonna use this total that includes both the estimated returns and the regular inventory. So this, the ones that are in the white here, the beginning inventory is there. And then the ending inventory, the combo again of the inventory and the estimated returns inventory. So we take this 53, I can't read it very well. Um, let me go just a little bit here. 53.2 is our beginning inventory and 47.7 is our ending. So between the two of those, we add those together, divided by two to get our average. And there's nothing more to it than that. That's how we get the number. So let's go back to our calc and you can see that's what they did. They took the cost of goods sold, which is the same number from the income statement. And then they took the average inventory, which you could get from the income statement as well. And that's what they did, 53.2 plus 47.7, and that divided that by two brought you to an average inventory of 50,450. So you use your numerator as cost of goods sold and your denominator as average inventory, and that brings you to a inventory turnover of 4.8. Now, I can use that 4.8 to also, that is a standalone virtuous comparison tool by itself. How many times did the inventory turnover during the year? So you sold enough goods to, to have sold your entire inventory 4.8 times. Now you can also use that for another calc though, which is the number of days sales, a number of days to, no, not the number of days, I keep trying to say the number of days, the average days to sell the inventory. So what we do is take 365 days and divide it by 4.8 uh, turnovers during the year to see that it took 76 days of our, um, inventory for our inventory to sell totally. So one, one rotation of the inventory took 76 days. And so that's basically just the calculations that we would need to be able to do to do the ratios. Now, the other thing they want us to understand is about the closing process. And it's just like the other closing process we learned, except that we have to make sure we know what to do with these special accounts that relate to merchandise. So nothing's changed about how to do the closing. Nothing's changed about how to do adjustments. It's just that we have to add these things that are particular to merchandising. So the first thing is when they tell you about the inventory and the estimated returns inventory, I feel they're making it somewhat complicated by 
segregating this estimated returns inventory, but some companies do use that. So I'm not opposed to exposing you to that, but I do also want you to know that it's not always present. There's not always an estimated returns inventory that's gonna be showing up on the balance sheet. Sometimes it's just listed as merchandise inventory, most times actually. And so in these cases where they're showing us how to do it that way though, I do need you to know how to deal with that so it doesn't trip you. So when it's time to um, do the closing entries, there'll be first these adjustments to, to straighten out what the current balance of, since this is a perpetual, um, this is a periodic rather than a perpetual example, they will have to rec record a shift from the beginning inventory and the ending inventory. And so the way they do it in this textbook is they clear out the beginning inventory as an adjustment to income summary as part of their closing process. And then they re reinstate the ending inventory as another adjustment. And that's why you're seeing here an adjustment for um, the income summary account. That's, that's deep first it started out at a number, then they, oh, I'm sorry, didn't, income summary didn't. Incomes, uh, the inventory started at a number that they reversed out and took to zero by putting it into income summary. That's what they're just showing you the income summary account here. And so that was the first entry that was made was removing the beginning inventory from the inventory account and put it in income summary. Then the second one is put the ending, the current ending inventory in as the balance of inv merchandise inventory and shift the, use the income summary account to do it. And then the third and fourth are removing the old estimated inventory and reinstating the inventory with the current new estimated returns value. And so that's what these first four entries that are made to income summary are. And then they go back to the way we always did it, which is step one of the closing process, which is to close all the credit balance accounts, which would normally be the revenue accounts or the contra expense accounts. And then the second step would be close all the debit balance accounts, which would normally have been the, all the expense accounts would be debit, would be closed into income summary. And then also the contras to the revenue accounts. And then the third step would be to close uh, the income summary account. Uh, and then of course, in the, in the final step, you would close drawing to um, capital as well. But in any case, that the only part that's changed is we're gonna deal with this inventory changes. And the rest of it is just like normal. Look at all the accounts that you have in your income statement for revenue and expense. And those would be adjust, those would be need to be closed. Okay, so here's where they show you, sorry, that here's where they show you from a spreadsheet what entries, um, the closing entries, and this is the traditional closing entries, where they take the spreadsheet showing these debit balance and credit balance accounts. You see the credit balance accounts in yellow. All the ones that have a credit balance are closed together with a debit because, of course, we're trying to empty the accounts. This is normal closing. If it has a balance in the account and it's a temporary account, we have to zero it out to start a new period. So with closing, we're always posting the opposite direction of what it is because we're trying to bring that account balance to zero. So that's what's happening here with this closing entry. And we are all the yellow entries you see are just closing out all the credit balance accounts. And then the pink is where we're still closing out the credit balance accounts, but they just made it a different color. So you can see that those came from the expense list. Those are contra expenses to the purchases account, but still we're keeping them with the revenue accounts because they are credit balance accounts. We're, we're closing all the credit balance accounts together. And then for the next entry, we're gonna close all the debit balance accounts together. And you see all the expenses that we're used to closing, the orange, the, reddish colored ones, those are debit balance accounts. When we start to close them, we have to credit them to zero out their balance. We're dumping all these accounts, both the, the credit balance accounts and the debit balance accounts, we're dumping the balance of the total in order to clear them to the clearing account, which is called income summary. That is our super temporary account. It's just for closing, right? And so we, we are closing all debit balance temporary accounts or all debit balance income statement accounts. And that includes the contra sales account, sales returns and allowances. And so that's why you see that yellow um, entry for sales returns and allowances being credited also because we're just taking all the debit balance accounts together and clearing them. So we're, if they have a debit balance, we have to credit them to close them and we 
the total summary of the credits that we made, we debit to income summary. Okay, and then the next thing, of course, we're going to close income summary, the net balance of it at that point to the capital account. And that's what's happening here on the 31st. Let's see if I get my mouse to come back to me. I see my mouse, but it's not really wanting to point to this picture. And then the last step would be to close drawing account to capital. And this is just like we've normally done. There's not really a big change in this. The only thing we changed was we added those adjustments to correct the inventory balance to actual. Okay, and then once the closing's done, you have the post-closing trial balance just like before, where the only thing that remains is the permanent accounts. So these are the actual ending balances, including the capital account being corrected now to be the number after all things were closed and the ending balance that the capital account really would have that would show up on the balance sheet. So this is just like we had when we learned about closing. It, there's not gonna be something different about post-closing trial balance. It will just only have balance sheet accounts on it. It will only have the final entries and then it's ready to start January 1 of the next period or the first day of the next period if it's not December end. And it's ready to start adding some temporary accounts back to track what's happening in the new period. But this is just the permanent ones that don't disappear when the period ends. Okay, thanks.